afternoon. If everyone can take a seat. Um, welcome to the Just Transition Funder Briefing, organizing new communities on the ground, uh, which is the third in a series of four funder briefings for funders organized by the Climate Justice Alliance. Uh, my name is Jennifer Summers, and I manage the Energy Efficiency for All initiative here at the Energy Foundation. And on behalf of our partner funders and briefing co-sponsors, uh, the Chorus Foundation, Sorda Foundation, Energy Foundation, the Libra Foundation, Fund for Democratic Communities, the Common Council Foundation, the Overbrook Foundation, Barrier Justice Funders Network, and the B Building Equity and Alignment for Impact, and the Edge Funders Alliance. Lots of funders here today. It's very exciting. Um, we'd like to thank you uh, for joining us today to hear our wonderful group of presenters who are leading just transition and new economy work in frontline communities. Um, one quick note on logistics. There will be a moderated question and answer session at the end of the briefing and that we ask you save your questions to the end. Um, for folks on the Zoom meeting, uh, please put any questions that you have in the chat box. Uh, there's a lot we're going to talk about today, so um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Kwan, uh, who will frame the discussion. Great. Thank you, Jen. Um, so I, I think as we heard from the introductions, there are a lot of people in philanthropy who are interested in this um, topic of just transition in new economies, so we are certainly not the only one. Um, so I want to just offer maybe like one perspective as we start off our conversation with some of our movement partners, um, all of whom have been or are currently grantees of the Chorus Foundation. Um, I wanted to start with, I think, just our own personal story around how we um, arrived at Just Transition as a framework that we adopted about four years ago. We started um, 14 years ago um, in a very sort of traditional climate mode. Um, and our framework was really around energy efficiency and personal carbon footprints. And I think the questions that we asked at that time were really much centered on um, information and lowering costs. Um, I think that is a, a set of frameworks that I think is very familiar to a lot of people in this room. We funded um, energy efficiency um, upgrades, pace, rate pair issues, decoupling, split mm -hmm. incentives. Um, I mean, I think we're all very familiar with this terrain, especially if you're coming out of the climate space. Um, and when we started um, to think about um, you know, what impact that we had had as a foundation after about six or seven years. Um, I, I think this will also sound very familiar to other funders in the room. There were some successes and there were some challenges, um, some very serious challenges as well. But we really asked ourselves, look, um, we've done okay as a foundation. Um, we thought we were, we thought we were being very thoughtful, but the, the pace of change around what is going on in the climate is not really meeting um, the challenges faced by the climate um, crises that we were um, seeing as a foundation and as a society. Um, and at that point, I mean, and, and we had started down this process even before um, our own uh, reflection process, we started to have much more um, uh, close contact with community organizations that we had been funding, some of whom um, came out of the climate movement, but some of whom did not, but were doing climate work. And that listening process was really quite um, formational and important in the future direction of the foundation. And I think it was really important for us that as we were listening to communities, um, community-based organizations working on climate, we, re we realized that one, you know, the, the world is much more complex than we wanted it, but we believed it to be in the, in the so very simple questions that we were asking ourselves. Um, two, even the questions we were asking ourselves were really bounded by a very narrow worldview of, um, I hesitate to say, or I'm not hesitating to say because I'm going to say it, you know, <laughs> a, a very sort of market-based capitalist worldview of the market will solve everything for us if we just really understood um, uh, uh, a certain set of narrow incentives around why people act the way that they do. And when, they, when we went into communities, we heard that, yes, communities were working on climate change. Again, even if they didn't come out of a climate change um, um, as their starting point, but communities were also dealing with economic crises, crises of participation in governance and crises in their democracy. And that while climate was front and center for many communities, that looks very different in different places. 
Um, people weren't always using the word climate. Um, and sometimes the campaigns didn't even uh, look like the climate campaign from the outside, even though communities really knew that climate was part of um, the core set of work that they were working on. And, and when we step back, I think we, sort of out of a sense of humbleness in a way, and you know, it's, listening to a podcast it was really interesting somebody said you know the word humble comes from um, the latin word for the ground of dirt you know so mm. what does it look like when we put ourselves closer to the ground um we stopped coming into conversations with our preconceived notions of what the work should look like and um wanted to emphasize well, what our community is working on and why and why do you have those strategies and why do you think this is working and, 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 and not about coming in with our strategies and our goals around policies, around outcomes. And um, what we heard from communities was this new thing. And I say almost everything that I have to say and everything that's on our website and everything that we talk about, um, I think many people in this room know Farhad, um, my colleague, almost everything we have to say is, is sort of stolen um, from our grantees. So the Just Transition Framework um, was adapted or adopted from our grantees. Um, and our current sort of orientation is, is, is also very much um, from the grantee community. And I think the core tenets for us about what Just Transition means is, um, one, again, from climate, we, we started very much from an anti-extraction point of view, is we can't just stop the bad, we have to start building the new. Um, and that it is actually the about both things need to happen at the same time that we couldn't be exclusive in our focus. Um, we need to be informed and engaged by communities, by what they're experiencing, but also how they're reacting to these situations. And this looks different in different places. Um, and we have to respect the expertise of communities. I think in our former life, we were very much like, oh, we're going to consult experts and we're going to hire experts to tell us how to um, move forward with our strategies. Mm -hmm. And I don't wanna say that there's no role for experts, but I think those roles have to be um, more defined what, by what communities need, what, what communities need, than rather than by what the experts are telling us, who many times these experts are actually disconnected from individual communities. Um, and I think third and most importantly, um, how, do we, how do we center power and power building in our work? That if communities are not building power, um, they can't control their own destinies and they can't control, um, be that central voice at the table for what the solutions need to be. They may have many ideas about the solutions, but they can't enact the, those solutions um, without um, power. So um, uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but I think um, I just want to close with this idea that um, I think in philanthropy we often can be smarter than ourselves. Um, and we asked sort of the gap analysis and what's missing. And I think a key change to the way that we have approached our work in philanthropy is, is not to ask um, uh, what can we build <laughs> that isn't there? So you know, that question of like what is missing, but what is there that we can build on? Um, because there is a lot of energy, um, there's a lot of work, and there's a lot of effective work that's happening in communities. And I think it's our role in philanthropy to listen um, to support and also to ask good questions. We can't go in blind, uh, blindly, but, um, but the work is happening there. I think it's for us to, to be open enough to see and understand what work is there and what our role is in being a partner to support that work. Um, so with that, uh, I wanna hand it over to the panelists. <clears throat> How are we doing on the slides? Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? Hi. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, hi, everybody. My name is Christine Cordero. I'm the executive director at the Center for Story Based Strategy, and I have the great privilege uh, to open up and try to start to draw connections between what we're going to hear from different uh, panelists today on what it means to build new economies on the ground. And so I've entitled this whimsically Milk Butterflies and Building a Kind of the Ground, which will hopefully make sense by the end of the time. Okay, I like it. So, oh, let's see here. Pointer. No? There it is. Uh -oh. Technical difficulties. Okay, I'll start. Well, I'll start with saying the Center for Story Based Strategy, very similarly to what Kong was describing for Chorus, it was seeded into how um, the work of the organization 15 years ago to be involved in um, 
climate and environmental fights, and also workers' rights. And over those 15 years, it was like, how do we make more explicit the things we were seeing and the political stance we wanted to take? Because we weren't doing this work just to put out catchy phrases and to win one campaign at a time, but because we believed in a world where all of us can thrive as whole people, where communities and, and individuals and the earth were in balance, and where people could have meaningful work beyond wages, where we can all have clean air and clean water and a stable climate. And that cultures are vibrant and diverse and not necessarily bought and sold off in pieces and that there was deep democracy. <laughs> this is the world we were trying to build and we weren't just doing narrative just to be smarter to be cute, but because we wanted to actually change things for communities that were feeling these things so desperately on the ground. And so we made that more explicit this year. Unfortunately, there are big barriers to that world we dream of. Um, and the biggest barrier that we saw was that everybody was dealing with this system that we started to call the extractive economy. And this was economy, a way that we take care of each other and the planet that is all about take, take, take. That is all about divide and conquer. That is all about some people get to have more and too bad for the rest of you. And we were like, what would it mean to change that? And part of how that system maintains itself is by telling us that nothing else is possible. Is by limiting our political imagination and saying no visions that you can come up with are worth doing. And so we've been spending the last 15 years working with over 5,000 organizers and activists, over 500 groups, to really think about what is it going to take to reignite our political imagination? What is it going to take for visions of change of something that is new? Um, so how do we get those new economies on the ground? And so we really landed on this of it really is going to take all of us and an ecosystem of people to build what our communities need. And part of that in our piece of the ecosystem is how do we harness imagination to build power? And by power, we mean our ability to influence our direct surroundings around us, whether that's policy, that's the capital and money we have to actually build the solutions we need, or is it the way that we control thought and what is possible? That that's what we mean when we say build power. And so I'm gonna always, I always like to start with a story. Um, that's where most things begin for us. So in the late 80s and 90s, uh, the, the dairy industry was in trouble. Soda and fruit people, were, fruit sodas and stuff were all up in the mix. Pepsi, Coke Snapple. were spending billions of dollars. Snapple, yeah, no, this was new. This was my childhood, like proliferation of sugar, right? And milk was like, oh, crap, what are we going to do? Milk still does a body good. That was very successful in the 80s. But they started to lose their clout, right? And they were like, we only have so big of a budget. And they kept trying to message on, like, sugar. Like, oh, all those are high in sugar. But the people that drink soda like the sugar. That's sweet, right? And so they had this shift and said, instead of trying to talk to the middle, what would it mean to actually talk to our base and turn our base and our audience into advocates? And they came up <laughs> with got milk. So now people remember this commercial. This is a guy who's eating a peanut butter sandwich and he's trying to win this trivia. Do you remember this? Yeah. And it was iconic at the time. This is one of the most successful advertising stories in the 90s. And that was because they had a shift in what they were thinking. And there was all this PR advertising talk about how you message to the middle. And it was really about how do you engage your audience and base to then move the ripples out from the middle out. And so I, I start there and then they like popularize a bunch of stuff. Look, if you want to be strong like Serena's sisters, you do this. They gave you different options for what getting milk could do in your life, <laughs> right? It was very bad saying from Austin Powers to Whippy to the sisters. And so I, I start there because, um, so my background is actually in linguistics. And <laughs> I don't like to reinvent the wheel when somebody's already said something good. Some of you might know Anat Shankar Sorio who is one of the foremost cognitive linguists. And she says a couple of things that I think is really true, not just because it's based in good social science, but because we found over the 15 years of our work that it works on the ground. And so what we have is, um, wait a minute. Yeah. Oh, just, yeah. Here we go. Um, she talks about engaging the base and persuading the middle. And maybe I'm just gonna, yeah, it's maybe just a lag, or are you just... No, I don't know why. Okay, repetition and trust, it. <laughs> that it is as much about thinking about this as a series and sequences of communication and a conversation with the people you're trying to move, and that it needs to be repeated and come from trusted messengers. And that it's important to understand that while we, we obviously want to deal with the problems we have, that what we fight, we feed. And that when you are... If you give into soda and sugar, you are actually reinforcing your opposition's message. So what, we, what I say then is um, what we vision, we grow, which is the next point. So I talk about these as ingredients for building new economies on the ground because when you think about where people are at when they think of economy, it's very narrow. Um, and a lot of people are like, 
a new economy isn't necessarily possible. So what we found with engaging the base is that there are a lot of challenges and opportunities that we were seeing across the board. So just this year, we worked with over 200 groups um, in the U.S. primarily, and we saw some we saw some repetition of what we were seeing, what people were running into. And this is among people who are doing the work who have been in long-term fights around shutting down plants, who are building co-ops, who are doing policy. And around new economy, what we found is that folks were like, that's nice in theory, but is it really politically possible? Mm. Or our, our notions of bigger is better and what goes to scale, that new economy is not good enough to, to go to scale. And the biggest one is there actually is no alternative to what we currently have. Mm. And so we see in there a challenge and an opportunity in what is possible. And we worked with different groups to really challenge what does it look like to engage your base when those are what you're up against. So we did a very um, lovely project with our friends at Black Mesa Water Coalition, who you'll hear about the new economy's efforts they have going on the ground. And they said, we have an opportunity. We've really had a hard time engaging youth young people, and also people that are doing just transition related work, but don't necessarily see themselves in just transition. What would it look like to harness the culture of the Dene Navajo folks and the, the stories that are actually already embedded in their communities to make just transition mean something to people? So I'm not gonna go into this um, too deeply, but the two things that came out, and these are actually Jahan's drawings, are what would our ancestors do? Mm. And then Slay the Monsters, which is directly linked to a very deep Diné story that pretty much is about the power of the sun and fighting deep monsters in the ground. Mm -hmm. It's a very empowering story. And it's about how do you engage um, folks there. And then just to talk about getting to scale, um, I'm going to move pretty quickly here. This was work we did with the New Economy Coalition. We get asked a lot to say, how do you get everybody to do shared narrative? How do you get people to say the same thing? So we're more cohesive. And what we found is that the traditional PR model doesn't really work with groups that are actually engaged in, um, in communities and in bases that, they're, that they are accountable to. And so we worked with New Economy Coalition. Uh, this was a two week, the one on the left, both of them actually were two week experiments were about how do you actually give people a shared framework but then allow them to fill in the blanks with their work. So you'll see on the left are things around new economy actually involves more things and what you work on. And then so groups got to take this frame and then populate it with whatever work they were doing, whatever policy they were moving, whatever organizing fight they were in. Um, more recently, the People's Budget in Chicago, Our Money, Our Vision, Our Chicago, um, we did that work with them. I can tell you with both of these projects, what we found so far as far as reaching beyond the choir is that a new economy coalition was struggling with engaging their members. They have about 190. In these two experiments, we've engaged anywhere from 50 to 75 of the groups in there. And it's taken a while to do that. So when you talk about building echo chamber, that takes time and it also takes allowing experimentation and risk and knowing that the traditional PR of giving people magic words to say is not actually the way to do it. Mm -hmm. Happy to talk more on how this works and the participatory process we go through with groups. I should have put middle in quotation marks because I do mean the middle is something that we see a lot in polling. Usually it has meant a middle class white, primarily heterosexual um, population. And I think for us, the middle means whatever the next ripple out is of people you're trying to reach. Mm -hmm. And often in our, in our folks, it's sometimes still our folks. Our folks are still in the middle. Yeah. Our folks are the middle. And so how are we then engaging the base to then ripple outward towards the middle? So I think things are really right for the middle. I'm not gonna go over each one of these. But these are all taken from uh, recent polling. And as we know with polls, they're there to, they're there, we're here to change the temperature. They take the temperature. Mm -hmm. So this tells me that just transition as a framework is really ripe. Economy is the top of what people care about. We're in a populist moment where we're talking about governance. People have never had this much confidence in ourselves, mm -hmm. in believing in the people's ability to self-govern because we have so many problems with the federal government right now. There also is a trend in business where there is a huge lack of confidence in big business and a growing confidence in small business. How do we claim our identity as people that are growing the economy and the business on the ground? And for energy, we're even winning on protecting the environment over coal, oil, and gas, and people want solar and wind. So things are right there, and I just have a couple of things. I, I'm not going to get to go over these. Uh, shout out to Jen's work, um, where you know there's the crossover. We've been finding that intersectional work is not only what's smart, but it's what's winning, and it's what people resonate with. So when you're talking about climate environment as it relates to housing, <coughs> as it relates to transportation, when you're talking about work and jobs as it relates to health, 
as it relates to how we misuse the resources on the planet. All of these things are interlinked and we're finding that people are actually getting wins and getting bigger and bigger alliances and alignment in the just transition framework. And these are just a couple experiments. I, the one I'll point out is Jackie Vermeer in um, Southern California. The youth wanted to move their agendas and people were like, the youth have no way to insert themselves into the city's agenda. They ran a shadow campaign and ran Jackie for mayor and the issues that the youth brought up shaped the mayoral debates. Mm. So what does it mean to do things, right, that allow you to talk about things in a broader sense that then got at health, economy, youth, jobs, in ways that are kind of sideways and people don't expect it. So I said butterflies in the beginning, what do I mean? Um, I'll end here. So in the process of a cater caterpillar becoming a butterfly, um, it completely breaks down within that cocoon and in the caterpillar's the body, there lives a, a set of cells called imaginal cells. They are dormant in a caterpillar's body and tells the caterpillar that you are supposed to become a butterfly. Prior to that, the caterpillar has no conception that it can ever become something different. But the cells within the caterpillar say, you need to grow wings, you need to grow feet, you need to grow this. There's this moment where the caterpillar's body stops fighting it, <coughs> and the imaginal cells actually link up and say, this is what we're supposed to be. And what's interesting is that the cells are already there, dormant. What does it mean to wake them up, and what does it mean to connect them to build what we need? So narrative ultimately is about maintaining hope and restoring order with imagination. And thank you. Well, I'm next. Yeah, it's A, that means hello. Um, and thank you to all the organizers and my fellow panelists and all the participants here and out there um, for listening to hopefully useful uh, <laughs> things that I have to say. Um, <clears throat> my name is Jahan Giram. I'm the executive director of the Black Mesa Water Coalition. Um, we work on the Navajo Nation in Arizona um, and we advocate and organize for a just transition. I'm just gonna say that. Um, and what I'm going to talk about uh, today is just share some of our experiences um, and the work that we're doing, the different phases of our Just Transition work since we started in 2001, and I hope that that's uh, useful for you all. So I'm going to power through this, uh, so bear with me. Okay, so I'm going to jump, jump right in. BMWC started in 2001 um, specifically to address issues of um, water depletion and contamination uh, on a region of the Navajo Nation called Black Mesa. Um, and on Black Mesa, there's coal mines. Uh, that's how we started um, organizing kind of traditional environmental justice, organizing communities, educating them about what's going on, getting them to make a difference um, in our tribal government and how these things were running. So our first Just Transition campaign was in 2006. Um, and it was after we were part of the success of shutting down uh, the Mojave Generating Station and one of the coal mines on Black Mesa. And just feeling <clears throat> that backlash from communities and miners who lost their jobs, many of whom were relatives of people who we worked with and in our organization, and feeling that, feeling that, you know, <laughs> um, uh, lesson learned. And that's where we really kind of shifted our thoughts um, towards, all right, so what also can we do? What kind of economy can we build? Um, since we're shutting down the fossil fuel economy here. Um, and our first campaign was really around the shutting down of the Mojave Generating Station, the sulfur dioxide um, market, um, having that, those resources associated with the Mojave Generating Station coming back to the Navajo and Hopi nations who had been providing cheap electricity and cheap water to all of the major southwestern cities. Um, and so that's how we started. Uh, that was our first phase of our work, was really around just very community-based, very specifically based to, uh, to an issue um, and learning from that traditional environmental justice organizing. Our phase two, what I'm calling phase two of our Just Transition work was really about building a foundational infrastructure for Just Transition on the Navajo Nation. So this was tribal government level type of education, policies, <laughs> legislations, to create uh, a place <laughs> from which our tribal government could work for a just transition. 
Um, and it was a reaction to there being money, federal money at the time for large scale solar infrastructure for communities like ours and us wanting our tribe to take advantage of that. Um, so we did a lot of that work. We created uh, a commission and a fund within our government. We did lots of teaching about what does it mean? What does the green economy mean? Um, we did education programs with universities and schools and we created an incubator for um, small businesses, uh, Navajo run small businesses that would be focusing on green and restorative economy. Um, and <clears throat> we found that one of the challenges that we found during that phase was just that we couldn't find a lot of people who wanted to step up and say, okay, I'm going to be the first to create, start creating these businesses. So then of course we did it ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> the phase three of our work was like trying to come up with pilot projects and experiments to show and prove that it's possible, you know, for our tribe. And we asked ourselves, what is it that we as Navajo people already do and how can we do it better? Um, so we provide energy. Um, we herd sheep and we grow food. <laughs> so how can we build off of those things, as Kong said, and, 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 and use it to prove. So we did lots of research, we did um, created business plans, we did lots of trainings, we developed partnerships, um, and we learned a lot just by trying, basically. Um, and, oh, sorry, I went backwards. Okay, so the solar project. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try and resist reading everything that's on all of my slides and just kind of hit some highlights and, then, and allow you all to read some more if you want and ask questions afterwards. Um, but the success that we had here, I think is just a lot of learning. Our initial idea was industrial scale project on all the reclaimed mining lands, um, continuing to sell energy to Southwestern cities and then that will hopefully trickle back down to our communities and just, all that we learned in trying to make that happen <laughs> and the various roadblocks we hit and landing then really at our, I think two of our biggest successes out of this project was installing a small seven kilowatt solar system in one of the communities on Black Mesa, um, which includes the first Tesla power wall in all of Arizona, mm -hmm. um, but providing a, a place and a celebration, you know, a happiness. We had a big party with music and everything. Um, so that people can understand how these things work and that it could benefit all the communities. Um, and then another success out of this is that we spun off from this, a company that's based here in the Bay called Native Renewables, um, and it's working to build solar projects in indigenous lands, predominantly here in North America, but also other places. Our wool project, um, our biggest success is that we've been able to get wool producers to be paid more for the product that they're doing. Um, we've done, we did lots of trainings, again, built partnerships, um, where when we first started, people were getting paid maybe 25 cents a pound for their wool. We've got it up to $1.25 a pound for their wool. We have lots of options, I think, of how to move forward in these things and lots of opportunities to how to build off of this um, and learning about just like, where does wool exist? Where can infrastructure be built? What kinds of jobs can be created? <clears throat> and then onto our food restoration project. This is really about just producing food for our people. <laughs> our reservation is bigger than the state of Reser uh, West Virginia. It's 110 different communities. We have 13 grocery stores across that whole place. It's a food desert. Um, so we need to learn how to grow our own food. Um, so we have this learning center. We produce food on 13 acres. There's no irrigation. It's all about our natural land and how to use it um, and how to manipulate it. Uh, we've surveyed and mapped the food potential for so a region of Black Mesa. Uh, it's a lot of potential. We've restored 28 fields. Um, and then a thing that was kind of a side effect, um, a good side effect, is also that um, it helps with the issues of erosion, which are really prevalent on our reservation. And it's, you know, anticipated to be even more of a problem with the impacts of climate change. So this is also uh, an adaptation preparation strategy, too. <clears throat> All right, so many lessons learned and relearned, and I will kind of read this. Um, this is what we've learned through trying to get these projects going uh, in our communities, is that we have to meet our communities where they are at. Maybe they don't want an industrial scale solar project in the same region that they've just had an industrial scale coal project. Mm -hmm. I think that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, great, we'll adapt to that. 
money helps, but it's not the answer or solution. And that's a no, that's a weird thing to say to you all. <laughs> I think it makes sense. You know, it's, I, I worry sometimes about like, oh, people think that throwing a large amount of money into communities that um, have not had those resources, it, it can create, it can create more problems than necessary. So it's really not thinking only about money as, as what's going to save us. Um, we must provide for the direct needs of our people. So again, back to that solar project. Um, yeah, I also think it's reasonable for them to actually want to have electricity in their own homes and in their own communities before they sell it off again to other places. On our reservation, um, there's 28,000 homes that don't have electricity. So 75% of all the unelectrified homes in the United States are on our reservation. So yeah, let's provide for our people directly. We have to build from our traditional values and teachings. Uh, movement building matters and movements don't necessarily mean organizations. So we're one nonprofit organization, but there are a lot of other organizations and people and organizers and campaigns on the reservation that we work with um, who also need to be resourced but aren't necessarily wanting to create 501c3s, you know, <clears throat> and I think that's reasonable as well. Um, partnership does not mean paternalism, which I, I, I think we get a lot of, um, or another way of saying that is to pick our partnerships wisely. Um, it's all related, uh, issues of energy extraction are related to issues of trafficking of women on the reservation. Um, so just transition is, uh, overlaps many different things. Healing is key and, or unlearning is important as learning. So, um, when we go into these communities and have difficult conversations, and these are places that have been extracted and impacted for decades, you know, there's a lot of trauma there, um, a lot of impacts of colonization that need to be addressed too. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to speed through these. Um, and so then what I'm calling our next phase of work, I'm calling restoring our culture with resources. Um, so what we've learned is that it's important for us to build for our culture. That's what motivates people. So when I say restoring, I'm talking about things like this, what I call the inspiration campaign things that will make people um, connect to what we're doing from a traditional communal way. <clears throat> um, our culture, so this was a project we did last summer building a traditional hogan near one of our sacred mountains in Colorado. This motivated so many people. Um, this built power in our communities and it is related to the shutting down of the Navajo generating station. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, and then, oops, with resources. So what I mean by that is, yeah, we, we, let's fund this. Let's <laughs> fund especially youth leadership support. And I don't, because I don't want to say youth leadership development because I feel like they're already way further advanced and have such a better vision sometimes than me. So it's about supporting them, building the infrastructure for all of us who do organizing across the reservation making sure we have alignment and then capital expenditures, I think are a big part, a big piece of what we're doing next to equipment, buildings and infrastructure, which just doesn't exist on our reservation. And I'm going to end there and just leave up some questions that I had for you as funders and foundations. Um, yeah. How, like, how are you working for just transition within your foundations institutions? What's your vision and how does it align with ours or does it not? Um, and what do you know about rural, indigenous, and other what I call sacrificed communities? And how does what you know inform your funding in these places? So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Jaren from Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jaren, and I'm, as Jan mentioned, I'm with Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, and um, want to open also by just uh, really acknowledging that it's great to be a part of this process, and I really appreciate the leadership that the Climate Justice Alliance has taken, and really kind of framing that there is this larger ecosystem that has been for many years really, um, you know, developing this vision of just transition together along with our funding partners, our members. Um, so I'm excited to be here and talk a little bit about kind of the, the piece that uniquely GGJ brings into that. Um, and so, um, does this work? I need to press the arrows. Okay, got you. Yeah. That's it. All right. So, um, 
one of the important pieces to understand around grassroots global justice is that we were um, really founded in a unique role around creating relationship for deeply rooted grassroots organizations with international social movements. So we're an alliance of you know very deeply rooted community organizations like APEN and the Black Mesa Water Coalition. Um, and part of what, what happened um, through the um, World Social Forum process through other um, international processes that were bringing us in relationship to world movements like La Via Campesina or feminist and LGBT movements in Tunisia. Um, sorry, whoops. Um, is that um, we realized that we needed a forum to, to deepen um, strategic conversation and relationship with each other. So we see deep value in being able to, to locally root in a place-based way that, that everyone is talking about today, and also to, at the same time, um, look widely and, and understand um, the global um, relationships as well that, that interconnect our, um, our work, especially when we're talking about issues of economic and energy transition. Um, and so um, we uh, to share the model that I think many people here understand that um, that there's a strategic power that comes from deeply rooted grassroots organizations that it's not just that we all of us I think share the understanding that people need to be the ones making decisions around what's impacting their lives and the policies around them but also um, there's an important place of strategic power that uh, locally rooted frontline communities have and I think especially when we're talking about these urgent years around the climate crisis where we know that we have to be stopping the um, burn of fossil fuels we have to be directly addressing um, what's happening with extraction at the source and there is a, a power that we've seen um, that uniquely frontline communities have like black mesa water coalition taking on the mojave generating plant that proximity like apen has to chevron or like uh, the standing rock sioux nation have that that's where we're actually seeing some of the most effective strat strategic taking on of that um, the, the the largest contributors to um, global warming and to the climate crisis um, so from that strategic position um, all of us, you know, have been collectively building. I think you all are familiar with this framework. I just wanted to um, bring it back as a context that this is um, a framework of just transition that comes out of you know, more than 30 years of the environmental justice movement, um, along with organized labor, um, but then has been really developing through the work of the Just Transition Alliance, of CSS, uh, you know, Center for Story Based Strategy, um, the Indigenous Environmental Network, um, you know, uh, the Ruckus Society, uh, all of us together in the forming of the, the Climate Justice Alliance. And GGJ was very much a part of this, the creation of this framework. And I think that w why it's important to note that is that um, it's a developing process where our international relationships with social movements is also helping to form this vision. Um, because I think, it, you know, in, there are many ways that the question of energy transition and systemic alternatives is happening globally, um, from the, the movement of people affected by dams in Brazil, um, La Via taking on uh, questions of, an, of industrial agriculture, or even um, reflected here in the living economy piece of our vision of, um, you know, a, a visionary opposition is some of the ideas that came out of Buen, the concepts of Buen Vivir and the Cochabamba Accords and um, the work of indigenous communities um, in Ecuador and Bolivia really bringing forward the idea that we need economies that serve um, the interests of life and respect the rights of nature. So that interplay and that evolution of the work is I think one piece that we're contributing, but the other way that we really see that our contribution to this work of building new economies um, is popularizing this idea. So there's been a lot of interest in just transition we found in, in our grassroots movements, but it's kind of been a, a buzzword in some ways. People hear about it, they get excited about it, um, but there's been a real need to deepen what that means. So we've been a part of building out um, a series of just transition assemblies um, that give a chance for people to kind of build on the the model of people's movement assemblies. They've been fairly large gatherings, like in Jackson, it was a, uh, at least 200 people in Portland, a couple hundred people in Vermont, over 400 people coming together, really looking at um, from their own uh, connected experience in their local community, what would it mean to begin to envision um, a regenerative economy, a feminist economy, an economy that meets the needs of um, the people um, and also um, includes a, a different vision around um, ecological um, and environmental issues. Um, the other interesting thing about the assemblies is it's given us a way to, uh, let's see, I think not working anymore, sorry. 
Sorry, some people were saying that you're skipping a little bit, so I was just um, checking. So. Oh, no, thank you. Great. All right, cool. Um, so that the model has been applied in every one of these assemblies to the issues of, of energy and of economy, but also it's been a, a chance for people to talk about the idea of how do we take a model of fighting what we're against and building what we're for and apply it to other local struggles because our movements are not, are not single issue, they're not siloed movements. So um, the assemblies have been another vehicle for that as well. And one of the examples I'll say is um, in that top photo in Portland just recently, um, the organization OPAL has been advancing around it, um, transportation and environmental and ecological justice from the, that framework for many years. But as we were building the assembly and as they were trying to build out a just transition framework for that work, they also were really seeing a rising uh, crisis around um, white nationalism and racially based violence. And so they wanted to say, what's a, a model of applying visionary opposition when we're talking about taking on issues of racial and economic justice as well? And that's been true in all the assemblies. So these are some of the distinct issues that have come up um, based on what were sort of the burning issues like in Vermont healthcare or um, <laughs> in uh, Bellingham Food Sovereignty. So um, that has been part of how we've been trying to then um, oops, uh, build, um, build, uh, help to build this vision of creating new our power communities. So the, the assemblies have been a way that we've been bringing new organizations in um, and deepening the idea of just transition and get creating a shared understanding of it. One of the things we found is that what they didn't do is create a, an ability for people to develop a campaign because of these massive gatherings, several hundred people, a lot of new ideas. Uh, it does um, bring forward the wisdom of folks, but it's kind of more brainstorming from what they know. And so this year we're actually uh, partnering with CJ, with the Climate Justice Alliance and the Just Transition Alliance to also develop something we're calling Strategy Labs, which are gonna go then deep in with some of these communities that um, have already been uh, developed a level of excitement and enthusiasm around just transition but want to emerge a campaign and so we're looking at uh, for example um, uh, in Fort Berthold where um, there's already actually a tremendous amount of work that's been done it's one of the most extreme sites as you all know of um, of energy extraction, there's over 2,000 fracking wells. And so um, there's already actually already a demonstration site that in the Indigenous Environmental Network for Berthold Power have been building together there. But um, they're really looking at how do they make that, amplify that work and make it more visible, make it known. And, and there, it would actually be one of the most impactful places where if you can demonstrate that just transition can happen in Fort Berthold, it begins to show what's possible other places. So we're looking at doing three to five strategy labs this year to help strengthen um, the campaigns that are in development and help build this model of, of growing to 50 new R power communities in the next four years. Um, and then lastly, just coming back to then, how does this relate to the concept of internationalism? And I just wanted to return that we are, are finding that, that globally there's a real, this is a, a growing interest, a growing um, model that people may not always use the term just transition, but the question of system change, of alternatives um, is, is very live and that there's a real connection back and forth through having this long-term relationships with groups like Copin, with La Via, with Amave, with the World March of Women. Um, and so one story I wanted to share here is this is from the, um, during the UNFCCC uh, climate conference in last year in Morocco, the COP22, the one uh, earlier, um, that there's been a tremendous, uh, a serious drought affecting the workers in, Mor in Morocco. And so we did an exchange, a week-long exchange with the agricultural <laughs> union there, um, talking about um, their vision. And they were asking for training um, from us in exchange around the visions of just transition and how they could apply it in the context of Morocco. And it was the same time when Standing Rock was so live everywhere and they felt such deep connection to that question of how do we link water defenders globally from the MENA region to the Americas. Um, and that's, I think, where we see that um, there's a strategic a relationship that we can keep building with one another to then bring those local voices back to the global stage. And so um, that's the other way that we are really trying to contribute and then taking these local, local expertise and, um, and APEN and Black Mesa Water Coalition are two organizations that, that we think um, are part of the many that need to be heard at these the international climate mobilizations where we can really bring our solutions to the, the international stage. Um, so kind of rush through that there, but it's really exciting to be here with you all. And um, I'm going to then pass it to Mia. Thank you, Jen. Thanks. 
Um, yeah, thank you everyone for participating in today's uh, briefing. My name is Mia Yoshitani. I'm the executive director of the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, and I am really just filling in um, for <laughs> another one of our um, amazing local partners, uh, Doria Robinson, who's the director of uh, Urban Tilth and um, in Richmond, California. And so um, some of my presentation was a little bit thrown together, but um, <laughs> I think I'll, I'll, I'll be able to cover what I want to, but I won't have as sophisticated a, a, a smooth transition on my slides, so forgive me for that. Um, but APEN is a 25-year-old organization this year um, that has been organizing at the intersection of racism, of poverty, and pollution, organizing for power with the Asian Pacific uh, um, Pacific Islander communities, low-income immigrant refugee communities in Richmond, in Oakland, is our, where, our, where our primary local bases are, and then statewide as well. Um, in the last five years, we've grown to have a reach of over 80,000 uh, API voters in every, uh, every election cycle, um, not to mention the kind of local shifts that we've been able to um, create by building real power with um, the communities that we've been already talking about. So what I'm so impressed with the presentation so far is you can really get a sense of the complexity of, of the movement ecology that we have um, represented as part of the Climate Justice Alliance, but also part of our broader set of movement partners, um, people organizing on the ground all through like uh, movement uh, support organizations and policy experts and all based in the real um, solutions driven by local communities and the communities that have been most impacted by the extractive economy. So it's, it's great to get a sense from all the different panelists, like how the breadth of the strategy and the depth of the strategy, which I think is really impressive and part of why I think it's succeeding. Um, so Richmond, California, where I'm going to kind of bring you back to our, our where we're talking about is, mm -hmm. as you know, kind of uh, a century old home of one of the largest fossil fuel companies in the world, one of the la largest uh, global uh, companies in the world, Chevron, um, and APEN for the past 25 years has been with multiple other organizations, other um, organizing communities. Uh, have been really on the front lines of holding to account that global institution, not just for its impacts in Richmond, but for its global impacts as being one of the um, creators of the climate crisis that we're in today. And so we always like to say, you know, we at, the, at this intersection of poverty, racism, and pollution, we are on the front lines uh, and always have been of the climate crisis, whether we called it that um, or not from the very beginning. Um, and one of the things I really wanted to kind of emphasize, even though we are talking about kind of a sliver of our strategy that is the, um, what's, the what's the local economy experiment shifting um, our local economy from dependency on the the fossil fuel industry, i.e. Chevron, but a whole other number of 250 uh, local polluters that, that surround Richmond. How are we, you know, what does this experiment look like in Richmond? Um, but I, I also wanted to make sure that we are connecting the experiment that we have um, <clears throat> with the larger effort to build power in the community and that what has happened so far to allow us to get to the stage where we are um, kind of on the front lines of the experimentation of the new economy um, has been decades of organizing, decades of building both electoral power and uh, community power and worker power in, in this, um, at this intersection. So I feel like that's kind of I wanted to get to my main point first, <laughs> so I don't lose the opportunity to actually say that. Um, and so APEN uh, is like Urban Tilth, Urban Tilth part of the uh, Climate Justice Alliance and most of the people around this table who have been panelists are part of the Climate Justice Alliance, that were the, uh, the, the, the creators of the Our Power campaign, so this first slide. And I'm bringing this because 
uh, Richmond, I feel like is a little microcosm of the larger national armed power campaign. And so what we've created locally with our unique set of, of allies that are part of the Richmond Our Power campaign are doing very similar things to things that Black Mason Water Coalition or other, other members of the Climate Justice Alliance in the Our Power campaign to do things like this, to shift our, our clean, our, our energy economy to, a, to a democratized and clean energy away from fossil fuels. And because we're talking about energy so much, I wanted to make sure we're also bringing into the system this, the transition of, of, of agriculture and food systems and, and the center of, of those democratic, making those democratic systems and locally owned um, waste systems, transit, and to this I could also add housing and I can add a whole bunch of other issues. And that's also to just bring in the the concept that um, for just transition to work, even though there may be an entry through energy, for instance, like transitioning the energy infrastructure, um, all of these solutions are need to be aligned and, and coordinated on a both a local level, a national level, and an international level. Parallel to that are power building strategies to make those things possible, to make them happen, also need to be aligned. And that is why I think that's the heart of what intersectional actually means. It's not just um, intersectional in, in the policy approach, or, but it's intersectional in the way that uh, we're bringing together the real issues of people who are most impacted into that set of solutions that we have. Um, so as part of the, the Our Power campaign, um, we have been, and what makes uh, locally the Richmond, um, the, the Richmond sort of Just Transition Fund and our kind of economic vision possible has been this idea of, of not just creating a financial cooperative in Richmond to make our, our sort of uh, vision for um, worker owned cooperatives that actually build a regenerative local economy, making that possible, it has to be connected to um, these uh, national and global and local divestment campaigns. So for example, when we look at, we're actually trying to take Chevron, take Chevron's uh, tax for instance like using the taxes that chevron is paying to the city of richmond to actually invest in mm -hmm. the just transition away from the fossil fuel dependency that we have right. so for both workers and community and i i put this slide up because it doesn't work without both of these pieces so the the organizing for a financial cooperative doesn't work without the muscle of the of the reinvestment campaigns behind it So Cooperation Richmond is the example that we're talking about. And this was like a dream that came to us out of our years of struggle against, as just as Jahan was mentioning, uh, we spent years struggling finding a solution to uh, this mega polluter in our backyard. Mm -hmm. um, and we realized that it's, for us, we need to actually be not just creating a, or, or kind of talking about a vision, we need to be building the new at the same time that we're saying we have to transition away from the impacts of the fossil fuel industry. And so in order to do that, we needed something like Cooperation Richmond, which again is like a sliver part of the strategy, but Cooperation Richmond for us was a, a, a unique way to, um, to uh, democratize both the workplace and the local economy that needed to be built in order to make our vision real. So we um, have set up and just launched Cooperation Richmond officially in October, even though it's been many years in the, in the making. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it is both a one-stop shop for um, supporting worker-owned cooperatives that um, 
fit into the, the value system of just transition away from the fossil fuel economy. So sustainable, environmentally and economically sustainable businesses that are uh, de democratically run and owned and by the community. Paired with uh, actual capital support, real money <laughs> that can invest, that's coming from divestment campaigns all over the country coming from divestment dollars from the fossil fuel industry and then feeding this new regenerative local economy. And that's the whole concept of cooperation Richmond. And why I'm also sorry that Doria couldn't be here today because she, she's been at the heart of this idea. Um, Urban Tilth is one of the organizations that's been uh, that's featured in cooperation Richmond, uh, featured strongly and has been really part of bringing in the the kind of vibrancy of the local community into the idea. And then I'm going to skip through all these fascinating slides about cooperation Richmond <laughs> and our values. <laughs> I already mentioned these, the, um, the ideas and the context. But um, so I wanted to also get to back to locally um, the backbone of some of the power that makes things like cooperation Richmond actually possible um, so that we don't forget that um, it is actually years and years of organizing and power building um, and talking to people about the vision that they have and encouraging people to go out and vote vote on the on behalf of that vision not just a election to election cycle but so I, I'm bringing up some of our core partners who are also part of the Richmond Our Power Alliance, um, <laughs> and and the, and bringing back, you know, we're able to pass really important issues on housing and affordability because of our work on just transition in the community. That um, foundation was laid, and the trust was built with the community that allowed people to really put the weight of their vote behind just transition. And these are the faces of that work. Um, so I'll end there because I know I've already gone two minutes over, but <laughs> um, I, I really just wanted to, um, again, say how much I appreciate being with the rest of the panelists and bringing that creative, imaginative side into our butterfly story um, <laughs> and, uh, of what we're metamorphosizing into with Just Transition. <laughs> Now I am passing it over to, <laughs> to Allison. <laughs> hey, y'all. So we've come to the part of today where we're going to do um, questions and answers by our brilliant and powerful panelists. I'm just so grateful to be here with y'all. Um, I'm still thinking about the butterfly analogy <laughs> and trying to digest that. Every time I see Christine, she has so many nuggets of wisdom <laughs> that... I think will unfold for me for the rest of my life. So I'm just <laughs> grateful for y'all um, and this whole conversation. It's really important to be here today. I'm so happy uh, to see so many folks around the table and um, at home and at work, online, out there in the community. I know we have a lot of folks joining today. Um, so for those of you who I don't know, I'm Allison Corwin. I work at the CERNA Foundation in New York, but we do work nationally. It's a family foundation. Um, many of our partners around the table have been doing just transition work for about the last four years or so. Um, so we're really new to this space um, and I'm just grateful every time I have this opportunity to learn from y'all. Um, and so thank you for that. Um, and thank you to the Climate Justice Alliance for really holding the space and bringing so many of us to the table as Kong said. Um, so, so much of what we're doing um, has been uh, learned from and brought into our institution from our grantee partners on the ground. So, so many thanks. Um, and I think for certain it's really important for us as we think about why just transition, why this work, why do we find ourselves in this dialogue? Um, you know, we really believe what a lot of the panelists have said today about frontline communities um, actually being at the front, um, you know, of, of what's happening, the most impacted, and therefore have the most amount of knowledge and the best solutions about how to bring us all forward. Um, and so I think that's something we deeply believe. And I think that's a piece of what everyone was touching on around, uh, Mia, you were certainly just talking about, and you all were about building power. So spending some time thinking about cultural power and actually the construction of knowledge and who is seen as expert and who holds expertise. I think that's a really important piece as Christine, I think you frame this beautifully in thinking about the narrative and shifting the narrative of what is even possible 
Um, and so I think that's an important role that we are trying to play um, in, in funding and working alongside our partners on the ground around shifting that piece of cultural power. Um, and just transition, as all of the panelists um, spoke about, has really provided for us a framework and a systems level approach um, to living up to and into and holding us accountable to the mission that we've put forward as an institution at CERTNA around just and sustainable communities. Um, and so uh, it's been a beautiful thing to live into and to learn from and to try to walk alongside everyone. And for us, we're really thinking about um, how to support folks who are building alternatives, which I think everyone spoke about today, um, and simultaneously building accountability and holding those currently in power accountable for decisions, and then building democracy. I really appreciate Mia, um, you bringing in, uh, thinking about how that's trans how just transition work on the ground has translated to some political wins and what that looks like. So thank you for all of that. Um, and our work is reflected, you know, and I think your work and what we've learned. So a lot of appreciation. Um, and I think Christine, you said something I'm paraphrasing, but what we give our attention to grows. And I think it's really important as philanthropy to pay attention to that. So thank you for bringing that. And Christine, I also think you were the first person that brought to my attention in talking about um, the environment and economy and what do those things have to do with each other. I think you and I were having a conversation about them being twins separated at birth. And so, you know, we, we sort of jokingly talked about that, but I think um, we're really thinking about that intersection and um, the isolation of those things, I think is something that uh, oftentimes those that are trying to keep the current cycle of extraction and oppression in place, um, isolate those things very intentionally. And so how do we work at that intersection? Um, so that's enough from me and about the work that we're doing um, in partnership with y'all. I really want to open it up to everyone online and in the room to ask your burning questions you've been holding this whole time. Um, I think just to get us rolling, I have a lot of questions, um, but maybe I'll toss out one to everyone because I knew you had to move through your presentations pretty quickly and I think you each touched on the nature of holding a couple of things at once, which is how you're deeply connected to and rooted in your own communities and doing that work and simultaneously um, understanding and believing in the nature of doing sort of translocal work with your partners, um, both across the country and internationally, um, and the importance of building that power in an aligned way. And so I just want to give a little more space for everyone to sort of answer, reflect, talk to all of us about just the challenge and opportunity that it brings to hold both of those things at once. Um, and obviously the Climate Justice Alliance um, is a very powerful alliance of folks who understand the connected nature of all of the work. But how is it for y'all to hold both the grounded nature of what you're doing in your communities and at home, which demands, you know, so much of your time and attention and care and feeding with sort of understanding that you're working translocally with all your partnerships together to build that power. <coughs> So I just want to give some more space to that for whoever wants to respond. Well, it makes, it makes more work. <laughs> but, um, it, the, the thing is that um, what, what we know by d having done the work for so long, doing the organizing work, the local organizing work is the heart of, of APEN's work, the heart of Black Mesa Water Coalition, so, the heart of so many of, of our organizations work like that and we are accountable to those members and that that community um that that anchor is what allows us to then go and fight for policy at other levels or fight campaigns or fight for results or or new democracies or new infrastructure or whatever it is that's actually really rooted in what our community's needs are in a in a really fundamental way, and I, I think it's it's you know it's both um, it is both something that is extraordinary and necessary at the same time, and it, it allows us to have a level of expertise that no one else has because we are the experts of our own of our own experience and our own needs, and without then being able to articulate. Uh, you know, the set of change and policy change that is directly connected to that. Like then, the, then there's always a disconnect and the solutions are always wrong, you know, on, uh, on some level, you know, and they're, they're just, or I should say they're never, they're never truly 
right. They're never, they never truly fit um, if someone else is speaking for you and making those, uh, doing that for you. So I, I think it, what's hard, hard about it, obviously, is it's intensely resource, it's, intense, it's resource intensive. It's, it's very hard to make the time to be both connected in community and um, build, build uh, new organizations that uh, create national networks or, you know, that build with um, internationally. But it, it, it's what we've always considered is just part of the work. That's part of what makes the results actually work. Uh, I just wanted to uh, add that um, I guess the way that we've structured our organization, I mean, like our organization has probably had an average of like three staff through all these years. And for the first half of our organization, there was no staff, you know, it was just volunteer staff. And um, I think we structure it like I, we often think about like, okay, I'm the more outward, outward facing one, Roberto's the more inward facing one. And we, we kind of share responsibility like that and, and go across. But I do think it's so important. And I think, um, <clears throat> I don't think I need to talk about why it's important to have a base and do work locally. Um, that's what we're committed to. That's the whole point of everything. But I really am an advocate around doing this kind of like national or regional movement building work because I feel like it's a place that inspires people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like they, they don't want to just hear me and Berto talking to them about stuff all the time. <laughs> They're like, okay, we know, you know. But it's I think that's part of what inspires people is – having someone coming in, making those connections and learning. I think working um, in the beginnings of CJA and the different uh, initial Our Power communities, I learned a lot from engaging with other folks because in my mind, I did think of Just Transition as fossil fuels mm. and climate change and environmental issues because that's what we worked on and that's how we worked. And I didn't quite understand how it was more than that. And it wasn't, I remember Will from EMIAC in Detroit was the one who kind of like blew my mind because he started talking about, well, our extractive economy is around, one way is around uh, black culture. And for mm. example, like hip hop music and how that's been like extracted and taken and profit and corporatized and changed. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, I was like, I didn't understand until that moment. So I think like, that's the importance of connecting on that larger level is it, it helps us to grow and evolve our thinking. And I think the, the uh, one other piece I just wanted to add on there too is that I think that there is a way where um, it's beneficial that, that, that people don't have to try to reinvent the wheel every time that we get to yeah. cross share and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, peer learning. And even though it changes and adapts, I feel like that is, is critical. And then there are certain times where we actually have a shared um, relationships sometimes, whether it's Chevron and the tar sands or the right. Amazon, you know, and, and, and then there's a whole different strategic relationship or even I, I feel like the pay up Peabody campaign as complex as it was mm -hmm. to have mm -hmm. Black Mesa Water Coalition, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth and more in St. Louis, along with the workers who are being, you know, also mm -hmm. abandoned in that moment, sharing a, a demand. I feel like that's a model we could keep sharpening um, at times too, even though that that's just a, you know, sometimes, but that translocal power um, can exert together. And sorry, I do want to add one more thought to that too, which is I think that we're seeing now with what CJ and GGJ and others are doing um, in sending delegations to support areas that have been hit with disasters. You know, and I think that that, that is going to be even more important in the future. Um, as these things hit, we know that our communities are not helped, supported, you know? So we have to provide that infrastructure for ourselves. <laughs> Thank you for all of that. Um, I could keep going, but I'm going to pause. Um, who has a burning question in the room that you've been holding? Our brilliant panelists. I know some of y'all's names, so I can call names, but I know folks have some questions. Anyone? I have a good one. Yeah, there's some online questions coming in right now that we're we're cataloging we'll get out into the room there's a hand it, down there oh i can't see oh crystal hi hi um so i guess i would just ask if um you all could give i'm sure you could give a long list but maybe the short list of what you think are the challenges for funders 
in funding multi-issue, cross-sectoral, uh, you know, multi-community issues. When we talk about intersectionality, it's easy to talk about it, but what do you think are the, when you approach funders, what do you think are the things that are the barriers that we're facing as we're considering funding those types of efforts? What do you think we need to know and be thinking about? That's a great question. I can start on that one. Um, I think the, the thing that is actually built into the extractive system is false binaries. And one of the biggest things I've seen consistently in funders who want to fund even the narrative work, which by its nature is connected and weaving, is that folks have single issue missions. So this is why, you know, you wouldn't have to stress general operating if folks didn't have single issue missions or, you know, this, the sector silos that force incremental wins in one place that on, honestly most times can't sustain itself when you're only going after one thing, right? So I see that as an, and then, um, you know, the, the, what is it, what we practice we think is continually true. Right. So if we if what I see a lot of the time is also um, the in the power dynamics of the extractive economy re-representing themselves in institutions like philanthropy that that are across the board of industry. Right. Where uh, folks who have less power can see the connections, but don't necessarily have the power to make the changes that need to be made in order to change the nature of the funding and hence of the power relationship between a funder and a and a grantee. So those are the two biggest things I see. And I've seen people get very creative, which I think your peers could probably talk to more than. Can I just jump in and add like a, a funder perspective to this um, question? Um, I think one of the one of the principles that we are trying to practice, and I would say our practice in, is imperfect and um, is in evolution. So I do think that some of the things we do recreates power dynamic, and we're trying to address it. But it's uh, not the top thing on my list today, um, including how our you know how much information we ask in our grant application process. Um, but uh, one of the um, Think our principle that we have is to not let our structures get in the way of what we think is right in terms of moving the resources out of like where we're holding it into communities and organizations that are um, that need the resources. So I mean, we have the benefits um, and just full transparency that you know our, our our funding comes from a living donor. Not all of that funding lives in the foundation, so we have the flexibility um, through the foundation to do it both as C3 grants, as, an invest, as investments, and we're actually quite fluid in how we define those things. And the only difference we see in that um, equation is investments is money that might actually come back to us, and otherwise it's a grant. Um, we don't really care about payback timelines too much, um, but we also can give C4 funding, um, and at times um, funding for candidate um, uh, races, um, not through the foundation, but through <laughs> the donor individually. And I, it, it starts from the principle, it's like, it's not about our structure, it's about the need that's in, uh, on the ground and how do we get resources <laughs> and how do we iterate our structures if we start hearing from our grantees and this is where we need sort of some level of accountability and transparency. Like our grants mm -hmm. tell us when they're having problems with us, otherwise we can't do anything differently. Because that, I mean, we all know the power dynamic is we always are the smartest. Well, everything we say seems so very great. Um, and I think <laughs> having the longer term relationships does help break down a little bit, but never pretend like the power dynamic doesn't. Mm -hmm. I want to add one thing to that, which I, I think a challenge is just a aversion to like complexity and diversity, you know, it's kind of like, I get a lot of, because I want to be honest with like, <laughs> all of the issues that we have in our region and on our reservation and, you know, like just the lack of even basic infrastructure, like internet and things in our area that's different. And um, as I mentioned before, that we're one nonprofit organization, but there's like Twanijana Ne, like Doda Fracking, there's all these other like groups and groupings of people out there um, that are also doing the work. And so I try and be honest about like, we want to like get resources to all these people. These are all the different pieces. This is how they fit together. And I feel like that I, I get sometimes uh, a pushback from funders of like, oh, that sounds like too, like too much, like too much work. Like, 
can you just like give me one thing and that and to make this happen and I just think that that's not realistic um, so yeah thank you for that and we have a question coming oh I'll hold for the phone are you sure yeah yeah okay um, well we'll go to online question then we'll yeah. you up page um, I just want to say I really appreciate the conversation around holding the complexity of the movement ecology as you were talking about and I think in your response just now um, listening and holding that complexity so thank you so we have a, a burning question from online um, so the question reads what funding approaches and relationship slash alignment work with philanthropy has helped to build the movement and organizing power um, and organizing power in this just transition work well pause there's a second part which is <laughs> what practices relationship approaches and funding strategies have unfortunately undermined the movement work um, lessons we need to learn as funders to be successful and build partnerships that strengthen trust and collaboration. So I think just the two sides of that partnership with philanthropy. What have you seen sort of really um, enhance and work well in your partnerships and what is unfortunately undermine the movement work that you're doing? I can start with off just by saying, you know, there is a huge difference um, between the so traditional funding system um, and actually having uh, funding driven by um, what the most impacted people really need and what they're saying they want. <laughs> so there's this, um, and, and that's like, that's a deeply rooted value of the environmental justice movement, of the climate justice movement, um, that we speak for ourselves and that the people who are most impacted by any system are the people who both have the best solutions and have the right to leadership and speak about um, what, uh, what they think the strategies are that are going to be most effective and so if you're open to and i also think that that value is the most strategic way to get what everyone actually wants you know which is a solution that really works for addressing this major global crisis <laughs> that is rooted in inequality that is rooted in a racism that is rooted in an economic a failed economic system um, but if you're so I, I think you have to be as a as an institution like any other institution like it's not just you know foundation but any other institution that wants to have an impact on this that's there's like this core value of actually um, elevating the voices of people who have been most impacted and that should drive and, and that's in a sense part of what Kong was saying is that they've been trying to do um, and I think there are many examples of how those things have worked well and how true partnership with you know if we're we're, we're supposedly all in this together right and like where where there is true partnership there's true power sharing of power and I think that has led to the, the results that are actually the most um, transformative um, so I, I don't mean to be glib. It's not a simple answer, but I think um, there are many, I mean, there's, I don't even know how to go into like, give some examples of when it hasn't worked. Well, like, <laughs> let's take, you know, around energy in particular, you know, the solutions that have not worked for several decades, but we put, pour billions of dollars into them, regardless as to whether they work or not. Um, you know, that, that's, that's a perfect example, both in the, um, the kind of approach and the technical solution approaches, as well as the, um, even the power building solutions that those have, those, those things have offered and, and those, those approaches. Have so I, I think, um, yeah, kind of, I, I'm I I'm not sure how much detail to go into, but, um, but yeah. Um, I feel like I feel like there's many stories uh, in our region around just like a focus uh, and resources going to like policies and papers being developed at colleges for Navajo, or you know, <laughs> like. I mean, and even our own people do that. Like our previous vice president was like, we need a new food plan and we're gonna ask Harvard to do it for us. And it's like, why, mm. how, like, you know, like why it's, it's this real kind of, I think 
paternalism and kind of like internalized oppression and white supremacy around what you said earlier, which is like, who are the experts? Mm -hmm. So uh, like, I distinctly remember, I think it was like Northern, Ever Northern Arizona University was so excited. They were gonna like come up with this whole transition plan for Navajo and what, uh, their process was really just kind of like going around to a lot of the work that was happening on Navajo, including <laughs> ours, and then writing about it. Mm -hmm. And then having a big conference where our president at the time, Ben Shelley, who's crazy um, and very cold, you know, um, we're going to invite him and we're going to present this to him and it's going to change everything for you guys. And we were all like, no, it's not, but okay. <laughs> and, and in the meeting, they presented to Ben Shelley. He was on his own tablet the whole time, like playing games and not listening and then at the end he was like well that's nice but we are a coal community and we only care about coal and that's it you know and so i feel like it's just like such a weird disconnect and of outside people thinking like writing a paper is going to solve everything for us and it's and i see resources go to that a lot um so that's one example <laughs> of a place, a type of funding strategy that I definitely see in our area that I feel like keeps happening and doesn't work. So, yeah. <laughs> I think quickly, and then we'll get Paige's question in. So y'all go ahead, Christine. Um, you know, we get a lot of requests, as I was saying earlier, for top down, give, get, have a group have magic words together, and then they'll move messaging, mm -hmm. and that will work. And this is an approach that does not work. <laughs> um, even as smart as messaging can be, even when we come up with it, when we're like as close to the movement as we are and we get in there, it doesn't roll. So I tell folks like, if you allow us to build on what's there, give us the time to create shared language, shared experimentation and risk taking, that's an approach that really works. And it may seem small at first, but we will get it to scale. The second piece and something that um, I always quote in every space I get to is Merv Marcano from Blackbird always says, everything moves at the speed of trust. Relationship mm -hmm. building is not an indulgence or an option, it is necessary. Mm -hmm. To move the type of risk we're looking for to get to new economies, you can only risk at the level of relationship that exists. Which means if we are paying attention to trust and relationship, I don't care how good your solution is, it's not going to move. We have seen hundreds of coalitions fall based on this principle, rather than whether there's the money or the right smart people, all those things. It's whether or not they have built enough trust and relationship to make big moves together. Mm -hmm. So when we invest in that and the process to do that and have the right folks there and or give us the time to build that, that's when, at least through narrative strategy, we've been able to move more things than when people say, come in and give people a box that I want them to fit in, whether it's this coalition or this alliance, and tell them to get in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. that has definitely and for us, that's awkward because we're really bottom up participatory and we believe in building from what is in the community um, and it won't resonate out of us by, by its very definition. It won't spread. Mm -hmm. John, did you wanna I just to just yeah. quickly um, <laughs> that I think that uh, this conversation obviously has been happening for a long time around kind of the funding dynamics. And I think the one sky letter, the dynamics of big greens getting enormous amounts of money. And I think that part of why, um, part of why CJ was cr created was to create a, a way where many different smaller organizations within the ecosystem can be seen and visibilized. So I think things happening like the building alignment and equity initiative, I think we are all invested in that around trying to shift money to the grassroots. And I think that that um, process is really important Important. And then I think also some of the really dynamic working happening out of the reinvest in our power campaign and the, the reinvestment fund. Um, you know, there's a possibility to, to take uh, money from pensions and, you know, again, like, uh, what is it? I was writing down as you were saying it non extractive finance. You know, how do we, how do we um, create for ourselves? Um, and we're creating vehicles, and this is a good time for us to, to do these experiments together. Thank you for that. And so much wisdom. Um, I know we could keep going on each of these topics. I'm really important to bring up. So thank you, um, particularly for talking about the shift of resources and the necessity of that. I think we're going to take one last question. So Paige, the honor is yours. Yes. Okay. Uh, so Paige of the Climate Energy Funders Group, and just quickly, having been in the climate energy space a long time, um, years and years ago, just transition conversations are very much around bringing labor in. Uh, so this is, I think, a, a fresh way to hear about it, Some, but I am curious how organized labor plays, or is that a 
kind of a separate um, just transition organizing conversation. And then secondly, um, I hadn't heard just recovery and resilience as a part of just transition before. And I think that's really intriguing. Like maybe it's, that's a really fertile space versus somebody who has a job in the coal industry, convincing them there's another job versus how, how we talk about recovery and resilience. So I'm curious, is, is that a new concept or in development? I, I just would like to hear a little bit more about that. I really hate to do this, but in order to keep us on track, I can only allow one person to respond and then we can have lots of offline conversations. So um, I know you all have lots of response to that really great question. Thank you, Paige. Okay, I can try to be really quick because um, I got looks. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to be clear that uh, the that our um, vision for just transition that is coming out of, of both the Climate Justice Alliance and the folks on this panel does include workers and includes mm -hmm. workers as part of the community, as part of the people who have been impacted by the extractive economy. And so there are very specific things that um, in any particular industry that's transitioning work like that particular things that workers will need particular things that community impacted communities that are a fence line communities to any polluter or you know for example will need and we just didn't have the time to get into each of those things but i i did want to be really clear that um a trans making workers who have been uh, uh, who both benefited from and impacted by the fossil fuel industry and the overall extractive economy, because it's not just, as John was saying, it's not just about the fossil fuel industry, but workers are our core part of what, what we consider to be like core constituencies and part of the impacted communities that need to have a voice in defining solutions. And workers need to be made whole um, when those particular industries or sectors are transitioning into, and that, that's part of the design of any individual campaign that's driven by a just transition vision. So, um, and, and locally, just APEN has had um, decades long relationship with refinery workers, mm -hmm. um, with local, other local uh, impacted workers, whether it be in the service industry or, or um, nurses or, you know, other teachers, um, organized labor in any campaign is a key component to how we feel like we succeed. And a quick shout out to Just Transition Alliance too, because like they are a member of CJA and I think, yeah, did really start these first conversations around what Just Transition yeah. is. And I think we're kind of taking it rolling with it. Yeah, and APEN was part of Just Transition Alliance in those early days. So we were part of our collaborative discussions with refining workers started with the Just Transition mm -hmm. Alliance mm -hmm. back in 1996 or something. Wow. Yeah. Wow. There's going to be a whole forum in Jackson right. on yes. your question. Which we're going to have <laughs> yeah. 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 So that is actually a perfect transition. Thank you, Christine. Just transition. Uh, just transition. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I couldn't resist. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> you jokes in. Um, thank you, Paige. Thanks everyone for your really thoughtful questions. I think the power of bringing us all together is always, yes, we're here in this room and online together as a community, but is to continue dialogue um, and to continue to reach out to each other and work in an intentional way to continue to learn from each other um, and move all this work together um, collectively. So thank you for all of the questions. Um, thank you to our brilliant panelists for your really thoughtful and insightful um, and wise answers. And I'm gonna transition it now over to Amaka from the Movement Strategy Center, who's gonna close us out. Hi everybody. Um, so I have the daunting task of trying to follow these speakers and wrap this up for us. Uh, Yes, like Alison said, my name is Amaka Agbo, and I have a pleasure of being uh, the Next Economy Senior Fellow at the Movement Strategy Center, um, and we're honored to be able to support the work of the Climate Justice Alliance. Um, in trying to kind of underscore what we all heard today, I think one of the things I would really lift up is that um, the ask. Um, is that we're interested in finding partners um, that want to be in deep solidarity, which means sharing both the risks and the rewards of what it means to run experiments that actually move us towards shared prosperity, right? And the part of the experiment is not just in the outcomes, but it's the softer piece of the process. So it's about the relationship and the trust that so many of the speakers have shared um, over and over again today. 
Um, and then the other piece that I would kind of just add to the conversation is that um, even though we're calling this the new economy, it's really about reclaiming the wisdom and knowledge that these frontline communities have held onto um, for so many decades. Um, and that for us to truly embrace and embody a just transition framework means that we have to listen to learn from and be led by the frontline communities that are actually doing the work. And so one of the great opportunities that we all have uh, an opportunity to be a part of um, is yes, the Jackson convening is coming up. Um, the National Just Transition Forum will be held in um, Jackson, Mississippi by Cooperation Richmond um, from February 26th to 28th. And oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, those speakers. And so um, we actually have a short video we wanted to show about the work um, really quickly, if I could pivot. This issue of solidarity economy, I don't think most people have heard that term. Explain what you mean. For us, what it means is trying to develop relationships that are not mediated by the logic of capital. Now, what does that mean? A bunch of fancy words. What does that mean? Jackson, Mississippi, I want to give y'all just a bit of a context. What we're dealing with in Jackson is that the folks who stayed and faced terror on a, on a, on a daily basis through Jim Crow and through just a, a system that didn't see their humanity. Because there's a, there's a pending threat of gentrification. And there's not a lot of you know capital wealth, but there is a tremendous amount of talent. There's a tremendous amount of energy. With folks staying, it also meant that people have a tremendous amount of resilience, ability to do a lot with the very, very little. The purpose of this together is to rise Jackson up and to escalate the understanding of what cooperatives are all about. A group of, of individuals come together, but they pull their resources, number one, together. And then they create a democratic structure by which they manage the enterprises together. And what we do, we're a network of uh, worker-owned uh, cooperatives that are aimed at building economic democracy. Trying to figure out how to work with each other in a democratic manner. And we see that happening by us being in control of our own labor. First and foremost, I don't view my engagement with you or anyone else in purely transaction. That both of us have, when we come to the table, some intrinsic value and we should find ways to exchange as equals within that relationship. The different co-ops, you know, it's Freedom Farms, Urban Farming Cooperative, Nubius Cafe. We have the green team, is Compost and land, Landscaping Cooperative. And so what happens is the food that we grow, it services Nubius Place. Whatever refuse that comes from Nubius Place goes to the green team, and the green team makes that into compost. And the compost goes back to the farm. To make Jackson a solidarity city, supporting cooperative development, do a fab city, digital fabrication, and having that as, a, as an aspect of community production. To make it a sustainable city, zero waste, a uh, goal of zero waste by the year 2025, but also human rights. We, we want to build a sustainable community, and we see that by having a local network of worker cooperatives, but also revolutionary arts and residents. We are proposing to let revolutionary residents street theater present a project that goes around takes off some of the youth off of the street who are in danger of imprisonment, teach them skills, get them to become aware of the problems that are existing within this community, and then have them take it to the streets to mobilize the folk. Join us February 26th through 28th in Jackson, Mississippi for the Building Equity and Alignment for Impact Just Transition Forum to align labor, frontline communities, and philanthropy with the vision, principles, cultural organizing strategy, and policy positions of environmental justice communities and grassroots movements organizing a just transition. To the Building Equity and Alignment for Impact Initiative for hosting that convening. A couple of other events I would put on your calendar. Um, this is the third um, and four different uh, series of uh, gatherings that CJ is hosting on Just Transition. The next one will be um, in March in Houston. Um, so please make yourself available to participate in that. Um, and then the Indigenous Environmental Network is having the Protecting Mother Earth Gathering June 21st to 24th. Um, and then lastly, we will also have going through my notes here, the It Takes Root Summit um, will be happening um, September 2018. Um, so please make it a point to be a part of these conversations as they continue to be the places for us to deepen connection and relationship with one another. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.